Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be taking a look at the DCS MI-24P, which has just uh, been released uh, yesterday, and again this is an early access helicopter, so there are probably going to be some things that are going to come up from time to time that are probably going to be fixed with time, and we'll do the best I can to point out. The purpose of this video is basically to give you a whole, kind of like a general overview of it, kind of take it for a short flight, sort of show you what it uses and what it can do and stuff along those lines. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, uh, when you climb into this helicopter, you begin to look around and go, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? So uh, what makes this really, really fun, of course, is um, you can get in the front seat by pressing the number two and you realize there's a whole extra set of controls that you have to worry about. The good news is, like most aircraft and pretty much anything that flies, once everything's been set up the way that you want it, there's really not a lot of fitting you're going to have to do with the different controls here. And you'll actually find this helicopter to be pretty responsive as far as they go. So first thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and close the door there. We don't need to deafen ourselves. Our little Petrovich AI folks, up front, I actually will close it as well. Notice we can't see the person who sits in front of us. Now, if I jumped up front as well, but turn my head around, you also cannot see the person who sits behind you. Uh, I spent pretty much all yesterday afternoon uh, playing with a buddy of mine in multi crew to try to try this thing out and kind of get a feel for the best way to employ it in combat. And we'll take a look at a couple of the different techniques uh, once we get ourselves over to a very, very mild combat situation. With all that taken care of, uh, let's go ahead and get this thing started. I'm going to go ahead and press the backspace key, and uh, although this is not following exact procedures, it actually works fairly well. Go ahead and lift that one up. We're going to go ahead and turn on both of our batteries on this side. We're also going to go ahead and flip on our rectifiers. We're also going to flip on one of our inverters, which is right here. We're going to leave the two generators out for now. I'm going to go ahead and spin my head over to the other side, and go ahead and open up this set of circuit breakers. I'm going to go ahead and pop these two. You're going to do that about 100 times. Pop the two red handles down, disengage the rotor brake, and now we need to take a look at our lights and our fuel pump situation. So first things first, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and flip on our formation lights just to let everybody know we're about to get this thing started. And then we have all of our fuel tank switches. We're going to go ahead and turn on our service tanks. We're going to set up these are the firewall valves for those of you who probably remember going back ages and ages ago. We have this switch right here, which is going to be our delimiter. We're going to skip the external fuel tank, flip on our fuel pumps individually. Now we're going to make our way to the fire extinguishers. There's two switches. We want this one, and we want the one on the far side to go ahead and enable those as well. Now that this stuff's all set to go, we've got our inverter. We can actually just start the APU. We reach over here, make sure it's set to start. Press and hold start, and give it just a moment. Let go. And what's going to happen is you'll notice that our exhaust gas temperature starts to come up for our APU. And you'll also see that we start to build up a little bit of pressure here. Now this is the exact same APU that they have on the AN24, which I got such a kick out of because uh, we saw this on a video almost seven years ago, just in a slightly different simulator in a slightly different context. So basically, once this builds up enough pressure, it's gonna go ahead and give us a little heads up to say, hey, uh, we have enough uh, pressure, we're ready to get this thing started, uh, let it rip. Now, normally what you wanna do is you'd wanna go ahead and call on the radio to let them know that you're getting started. Now, it's a little involved with the radio on here. Uh, to get that going, of course, we're going to have to activate our intercom systems, which are going to be all of those. Notice our radar altimeter. We want to hold off on that. That thing's pretty electrically potent. And then we need to come down to our actual radio itself and go ahead and turn up its volume. Uh, one of the mistakes that we found out when we were doing all of our experimentation yesterday was the fact that we forget to set that correctly. Next, we're going to go ahead and flip this to the on position, and we simply have to dial in the correct radio station. Now, this is squelch on this side. This is volume on this side. I'm going to go ahead and toss the Jadro all the way up there, and now we're in good shape. Go ahead and call air traffic control now. And as soon as you do this, it'll automatically set the channel for you. And it'll also uh, correct my little boo-boo there. And again, it says pops it on. We ask them for a startup, and they're going to go ahead and get everything and let us know. So we're all set with that, and now we're just simply going to start. Starting this thing is a breeze. We simply come down here and press start. <laughs> That's it. There's really uh, nothing else to it. Uh, once we press that button, of course, uh, don't touch the throttle or anything silly like that. Yes, I know you're supposed to let everything warm up, but again, this is just a basic little video to kind of let everything go. So I notice right here that engine number one's uh, starting out pretty efficiently here. Uh, engine one number one is uh, my least favorite engine right now because it is the one that always seems to take hits in uh, combat and we lose it. Uh, good news in this particular version of Early Access, and remember this came out yesterday, uh, fires do nothing to you, which is actually pretty amusing, but the engine failure realm certainly will make things very interesting for you. Uh, we ended up taking uh, two 30 millimeter rounds, uh, one to the left engine and one took off the right wing. It was uh, quite a fun experience uh, trying to fly home. All right, engine's on. Uh, we want to wait for our main rotor, which is that massive thing above our heads, to go ahead and get up to speed as well. Remember, you basically have a clutch between these two. You want to be very, very gentle with it. We get this nice little wibbly wobbly kind of thing as we start to accelerate. And basically, when this stabilizes and this stabilizes, we're good to go ahead and start the uh, second engine here. Uh, normally, of course, we want these things to warm up and all that stuff, but eh, I'm not worried about it too much, so I'm not going to stress. All right, we've stabilized. I'm going to come over here and start my other engine. All we're going to do is click the switch down, go ahead and press the start button one more time, and it's going to go ahead and get the other engine going as well. You can see immediately the thing snaps to life. It's got plenty of compressed air kind of pushing through it right now, and the whole thing starts to warm up pretty smoothly. 
and you can see uh, we're pretty much equipped for combat here, which is kind of cool. You have no idea how huge that rotor is, and um, the thing is so top-heavy, it will literally blow your mind. I'm going to take a look real quickly. It looks pretty good here. Starting to spin up. It's actually pretty fun. You have a blinker switch in case you need it, in case you need to let people know you're going to be taking a turn or something along those lines. All right, you can see my number two is just about into the safe range, which is going to be this little yellow line. It's going to take a moment to stabilize. It's going to wiggle a little bit. The main rotor is going to pick up a teeny tiny bit more speed. Again, we're producing uh, quite a bit of extra little gas, which our thing is basically going to capture and start rotating it very, very aggressively. Keep in mind, we're not at governed speed until we get into this range here. So it's going to take a few moments for that to go ahead and spin up. At this point now, we don't need our APU anymore. Normally with this APU, you want to let it kind of cool off for a couple of minutes, but um, we're, you know, I'm just going to hit stop APU and nothing bad will happen. I'm not going to stress about it. Now, the interesting thing with this APU, and I thought this was kind of fascinating, is you can actually run the APU's generator. You don't just have to use it for compressed air in case you need to sit here on the ground. All right, now we're going to go ahead and bring up the uh, RPM of the engine so we can go ahead and fire up the generators. So what I'm doing is tapping the page up key just a teeny tiny bit. And again, if we turn on our controls again, you can see that our throttle is this little guy right here, giving a teeny, 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 teeny little twist. And what it's going to do is as the engine comes up, you're going to notice that the rotor speed increases gently. And the moment that the governor kicks in, everything is going to suddenly run and basically spike on you as sort as, as, as RPM goes. Yeah, yeah, I got it. There it goes. You can see my RPM from my main rotor kicked in, push the uh, throttle all the rest of the way, and we're looking pretty darn good so far. Okay, let's go ahead and clean things up on this side. We're going to fire up both of our generators. We're going to close off our inverter. We don't need that anymore. We're going to go ahead and pop on the two transformers, and uh, then you're going to be in pretty good shape. You're going to get a little warning saying that the generator is running parallel. That's desirable. It simply means that the two different electrical systems are working separate from each other. I'm going to swing over to the side. And now we're going to go ahead and take care of all of our switches. We need this one. Now we're going to need this one. We don't necessarily need this one, but we can in the event that something goes wrong. We have our two gyros, we have our handy dandy Grieven, which is our computer system. We have our radar power, we have our radar warning. This is RWR, by the way. That's going to be up in the top right corner. We have our pretty old school RWR. You can press this button real quick if you want to check to make sure everything works on it. Looks pretty good to me. We also, of course, uh, making our way down, we have our IFS system. We have our flight data recorder, something that we're probably going to need. We also have the ability to dial in any pitot heat. Uh, not at this time, but we could if we press those buttons in the future. Of course, can adjust our lights and everything like that. Making our way down the side, of course, uh, you can take a look and we have all the different pieces here. This has all been secured and ready to go. We have an ARC U2, which uh, we're not going to worry. It's kind of like a sort of an emergency. We have this uh, whole system for direction finding built on board if we need it. But the one I am going to take pay attention to is going to be my ADF radio. So this particular one, you, know, you need to make sure you mash the control button right here after you select it, just in case the person up in the front seat goes ahead and uh, steals it from you. So in this case, uh, we're going to do a little tiny bit of navigation using ADF today. I've uh, turned on visibility, and we know that we need to go to tree one, two. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this one, set this to two, go ahead and grab this little lever down here, and we'll keep cranking it until we can get this to the number of three, one, and we're going to go ahead and grab the big one and crank that all the way to three, one, two. So now our ADF needle in a few moments, there it goes, is going to suddenly swing to life and it's going to help guide us to our direct target. Now the navigation system on this thing is unique, as you will see. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pressurize the cabin. I'm simply going to click this, drag to the left and pull down, and it's going to go ahead and fill it up with all that nice air. And you're going to get a little warning light that's actually going to pop out here. Coming down on this side of things, we're going to take a look at our stability systems. And we have a wide variety of different stability systems on board. First one you want to do is you make sure you actually push this button right here. Otherwise, the stability system is out. So you need to make sure you press that. Next, what I like to do is I like to dampen my yaw. I like to dampen my roll, and I like to dampen my pitch. Again, you can fly without any of these systems, and you can even adjust them yourself should you need to. It's totally up to you. There's also an altitude hold. There's a root hold. There's also a hover mode on here. There's also an altimeter. It's actually really, really cool, some of the different functions you have on here. And really, again, this will be an advanced video for many, many, many days into the future. Next, what I like to do is I like to rest control of my gyros. I'm simply going to press and hold cage. It's going to lock this one into place. I'm going to go ahead and press and hold this one. It's going to lock that one into place. All I have to say is um, when you lose a hydraulic power, you lose one engine or you lose one generator, don't be surprised if these suddenly die on you. Come down here, uh, we have our, course, our weapon controls. Now, the one that I do like to activate is I like to set my range insert on here. I like to set this to up to about 2,000 in case of an emergency. This is the master arm switch uh, for us. We're going to turn it on right away. We don't normally need to do this, but again, I'm keeping it easy. I'm also going to go ahead and set my sight on. You can turn on your gun camera if you want. But this is pretty much all set for what I need so far. Making my way over to this side of things, so we have our little moving map. Um, actually, it's not a moving map. It's this little plus thing that actually moves along the map. I would not, uh, let's see here, take a look at Air 100, 100, 100, yeah. It's um, 
it's different. Uh, the big thing you want to watch out for is the fact that there's this little switch that says power on and off. If you shut that off, it doesn't work. There's also this neat little adjuster on here where you can actually adjust your current position. In this case, that looks roughly where I'm supposed to be. One of the coolest switches is if you hit this one, this will actually zoom in. You can try to identify exactly where you're supposed to be. Like I'm noticing, for example, that I seem to be slightly off already and I haven't even done anything. So I can actually use these two knobs to go ahead and recenter myself where I'm supposed to be. In that case, it should be right about there. Perfect. I fixed it. Of course, now I switch back to the main map scale and you're good to go. Notice in addition to this uh, moving uh, plus, I guess you want to call it, you also have the ability to run an old school NCNS where you can actually dial in your exact course and you can actually use this as a way to go ahead and fly yourself there. But this would be a totally different set of videos as well. This is a very, very cool and very, very old school system. Generally, this system is okay. You're going to run into a problem at some point where you're going to get to your destination and it will say you're over here, even though you're over here. Uh, it's, it's going to happen. But again, you can always adjust to using those two knobs at any time. Let's see, we're carrying plenty of fuel on board. I'm not going to worry about that. I like to always set my lamps to the correct one, set my brightness. Uh, one thing that I do do up top is I always like to go ahead and adjust this real quickly. Uh, the reason I do this is because you really can't see well. Uh, so what I'll do is I grab the little thing there and kind of adjust its height a bit. Let's see if I can grab the right one here. Select our, there we go. And click and whoop. There it goes. Go ahead and lock that out so it stays in place. And this is good. Again, I just wanted to move that down a little bit so it was a little easier to see. I'm going to hit these two sync switches. Uh, you'll see why those are going to be important in a little while. And our total time so far is about uh, 12 and a half minutes. So uh, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. <laughs> Next, what I like to do is I like to pop into the front seat and take care of a couple of things up here. Of course, they have their own version of the ADF in here. If they want to take control, they have to push this button right here. You want to make sure their radio is turned on too in the event that they need to do anything. Uh, what we found out uh, when we were doing all the multi-crew stuff earlier is uh, we couldn't figure out exactly what radio station we're supposed to be on to make contact. It's kind of annoying. We have our intercom system, which we want to go and flick on. We have our safety switches for our weapons. Uh, we can either order it from the back seat to turn these on, or we can turn them on now. I'm just going to head now because there's really no reason to worry about that. Swinging around the front, uh, this is actually a really, really simple to use panel. Notice, by the way, um, I have no control over the helicopter because the joystick is like uh, over to the right. If I did have control, this will actually center and I can actually grab it. If I'm going to do that, I can press the C key and you can see I can actually control from the front seat. Press the C key again, it's going to push that away. One thing that we do have up front, which I really, really thought was cool, is we can actually manually control the weapons up here, which I thought was pretty cool. There's a switch right here that we can basically hijack control for, and we can even hijack the arming switch here, which I think is really cool. The one thing we do want to do, though, is uh, come on over on the side, is we want to double check to make sure some of these settings are done. I like to get the missile warmed up right away, because there's really no consequence to doing so. Um, of course, once the FDI is on, you can start going ahead and caging your gyros. Uh, caging your gyro on this one's uh, pretty straightforward. There's a button that says cage. Press and hold, and it'll center that sucker up. Next thing I like to do is I like to pop over here. This is uh, my missile. I'm going to go ahead and flip on the power system. It takes a little while to warm this up. Next, what I like to do is turn on my countermeasures. And this particular one, you want to do left hand and right hand. And there's this little handy dandy switch here. You can slap that to one side so that it just basically is going to use it. By the way, uh, the button you're looking for on the keyboard is called Launch Snars. <laughs> Make sure you bind that to something so you can launch flares in case you need it. So I'm going to the back. Uh, we know we're going to need this in a little while, so I'm just going to hit ground unit power. And now we're good to go. Jump back in the back seat, and uh, now we're having a little bit of fun. Now, something interesting, and I, I don't know what the obsession with this is, but um, you can actually turn on a little fan. And um, in this one, you can actually put your finger into the fan by clicking on it, and it just goes and dies on you. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm not going to stress about it too much. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to shut my fan back off. And there we go. Nice. Brzz. <laughs> that's probably the sound that's going to make. All right, we are now ready to rock. This thing is uh, nice and set up. All the different controls are the way we want. I've got no angry warning lights. I'm going to go return the chair back from which it came. And now I'm nice and comfortable. Give everything a wiggle. And now we're pretty much ready to go for our little flight here. So first things first is I'm going to hold down the parking brake. And I'm going to gently release it. And as soon as you do that, you're going to get this little rumble. And the whole thing's going to pull it to the side. Now, if you actually look down at your feet, you can actually... I'll kick the rudder really hard and let go. You can see that the whole system is stabilized, which means anything you do is going to require a tremendous amount of effort. And you're going to have to give it time to kind of respond. Now, some folks at this point like to go ahead and do a hover check. I'm going to worry about that once I get airborne here. I'm not going to worry about it too, too much here. I'm just going to go and give it just a little bit. Don't let this thing go in. Oh, my God, don't let this thing tilt because it is tremendously top heavy. Just a little tiny bit of brake there. Looks pretty good. We'll use this as our kind of ad hoc little runway. Looks pretty good. All right, so we're going to gently turn. Don't get this thing rolling. This is just like the F-16. You will dig a lot of holes in the ground with that gigantic rotor above your head if you're a little too aggressive. 
All right, I'm going to hold the brake down. Again, I haven't touched my collective at all so far. Note my collective is a regular throttle, which makes this a little less precise than you really want it to be. Hold that brake in. Looks pretty good. So what I like to do before takeoff is a couple different pieces. I like to double check to make sure my gyros are completely caged and everything's working. I also like to check that my actual directional gyro is facing the correct direction. In this case, it looks like yeah, we're at like a 260 kind of a thing. It looks like about a 260. If you need to adjust that, by the way, there's this neat little switch down here. And you can actually set what your latitude is. You can also set your different mode. In this case, uh, we're currently set to magnetic mode, which is basically grabbing on to the uh, magnetic setting and constantly updating the gyro. In the real world, this is a not terribly reliable method, so it's not unusual to use the gyro method and then use magnetic to adjust it, like if you know, you're know you doing a constant heading. Again, it's a pretty slick system. All right, everything's good. Give everybody a quick little wipe. We don't want to whack it too, too much. Remember, you're going to be fighting a little bit of the stability control system. Now, one thing I love about this helicopter, and all helicopters need this, is it actually has a trim control on the top so i can actually sit here and trim this helicopter before i even take off which is an amazing concept when you take this one off uh, we have kind of the uh, russian g as opposed to the j curve and an american helicopter you pull this back and you kind of go up to the left a little bit on the russian helicopter we're actually going to go and do the opposite maneuver this is going to be roughly where you're going to want to be holding your controls during the initial takeoff so the way we like to do this is a rolling takeoff because it's a lot less stress on the helicopter, especially if it's really, really heavy. So I'm going to smoothly increase the collective, and you're just going to have to play the little dance with your feet game. So we're just going to gently do it. Now you're going to notice as we start to pick up speed, keep in mind I've only had a day and a half to play with this one, the helicopter is going to twist to the left hard. So you have to kind of get used to that. And we're just going to smoothly increase the collective. And again, I'm looking just for a little tiny bit. You're going to start to feel it start to fight you just a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and give it a little bit of right foot. And we get ourselves airborne with a little bit of crosswind this morning. All right, we're going to go and press the G key to retract the landing gear on a helicopter. Ooh, that feels dirty. All right, we are on our way. So one thing that you're going to note with this helicopter, like I said, is you have the ability to trim it once you get in the air. But you want to get this thing moving pretty smoothly. We're going to go ahead and confirm everything looks good from the back. Looks delightful. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take our initial turn. With this particular helicopter, the way that it works with the anti-torque is you're going to go ahead and put your initial turn on, then give it just a teeny tiny bit of, um, I guess this would be anti-torque pedal in the direction that you're turning in. Uh, don't push the anti-torque pedal, then rotate. You know, this is not like a Cessna 172. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take our gentle turn here and uh, start making our way towards our general area, which is going to put us on a heading of roughly 100 degrees. Generally with this helicopter, uh, you always want to go ahead and take a left turn because it's easier to see, but in this case, uh, we're not in combat, so I'm not really worried about it too, too much. All right, continue our turn, putting our turn in here. All right, so that should put us pretty much right on course. All right. You'll notice during cruise with this one, it's very, 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 very easy to go ahead and trim everything out so that it goes just the way you want it. There's also a course hold mode on it, should you need. But uh, for this particular one, like I said, I just like to go ahead and use just a little bit of the trim to kind of get it exactly where it wants. There's another trimmer mode you can use, of course, as well, should you need it. But uh, for now, this seems to work pretty darn well for us. I'm going to go ahead and stabilize. I'm going to take a look down at that ADF needle. And of course, we've got our little uh, unmoving map. We're just going to proceed on a nice relaxing course. I'm noticing that my little RWR is starting to blink. Let's just give me a heads up that it's detecting some kind of radar signal. If you don't want to listen to the sound, there's a switch here and just go click. And now the light still works, but we're not going to get any sound. Oh, see how it's still working, but we're not getting any dings? That's usually pretty helpful. And we have just hit our red line speed. Now, one of these helicopters is just, it, it wants to move. Now, you're probably going, okay, so this has been pretty straightforward so far. You're sitting right at your red line speed. I'm going to go ahead and back the collective up just a little bit. I've got more than enough energy going. This aircraft likes to fly. I know I said aircraft and not helicopter, but it, you'll see what I mean. It really, really, really wants to move. It really, really wants to travel at high speeds. It really, really wants to climb. It is just, it is a lot of helicopter. Now, one of the reasons I really appreciate that is some of the other helicopters, it takes a really concerted effort to actually get it to want to move anywhere. This thing, once it gets going, it wants to get going. I'm going to give myself a little bit of right trim here. No reason to make things difficult for myself. A little bit of downward trim, a little bit of downward trim, a little bit of left trim. Go ahead and let go. Let's see if we got it. It just seems so naughty trimming a helicopter. It's just, a, I don't know, there's something about that. It's like a helicopter autopilot. It was like, what was this abomination? 
There we go. And that looks almost perfect. That's it. <laughs> I'm not actually touching my controls and I'm in a helicopter. That's just wrong on so many levels. Okay, so now that I've got everything nice and trimmed out, I should probably activate the altitude autopilot. I could totally do that if I needed to. You could even dial in what heading I want to travel at. In this case, let's say I want to do like 95 or something like that. 95 right there. And you even have a, uh, oh, not hover mode, not root mode, but there's actually yeah, an altitude mode that you can actually activate should you need to. But again, I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. I think this thing is uh, pretty easy to fly on its own. All right, I'm going to reduce my collective just a teeny tiny bit. Again, I, my hands are not on the controls. Name another helicopter that you can... I'm, yeah, there's plenty. Don't tell me. There's lots of helicopters that you can do that with, but this one, it's just it's reliable. I can just go ahead and do that. And again, I'm just using my little bit of left foot here in order to keep us going in a straight line. And we can even trim that out by adjusting the actual yaw control, which is what this little knob down here is. It's totally up to you what you'd like to go ahead and adjust that with, but this is working fine for me. All right, let's see how our little moving map is. Go ahead and push this button, and we're off the map. Actually, we're right here. You can see very clearly it says we're supposed to be crossing something called Krasnodar. Let's take a look out the window. Uh, sure. Ah, there it is right there on the right. So you can see this is us right here. So I'm going to flip it to the other side. And you can see we're going to be crossing a fairly good-sized lake in just a moment. We're basically riding this thing right at the red line at this particular time. We're getting a teeny tiny bit of climb. I'll go ahead and reduce my collective just a little bit. Again, I have no hands on the controls other than my feet right now. But again, that even that can be tuned out should we need. So very, 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 very reliable helicopter. All right, we got it. It's smooth. All right, let's go ahead and get rid of this. I'll need to look at that. And let's take a look at our weapons controls. So in this particular helicopter, you have a wide variety of different controls for the weapons, and they're actually remarkably easy to use. One thing you want to note, though, is if you are carrying anti-tank guided missiles like we are, they're their own system. So if you want to think about that another way, basically imagine there's one control box and weapon systems for the anti-tank guided missiles, and there's a separate one that's designed just for us for the purposes of you know, using our 30 millimeter cannon, as an example, or even uh, going ahead and using you know our different rockets, which we have on board. That's something that you're going to have to kind of keep in the back of your head when you're operating this one. Okay, so what we're going to do first is I'm going to set my cannon up. You have a couple different modes. You have manual range mode, which is going to be here. You have automatic range mode, which is going to be right here. You also have the ability to do manual mode, which is basically going to say, okay, whatever I dial in here, show me. Or you have what they call automatic, where it'll actually try to calculate. Now, the nice thing about the calculating system is it's decent if you're here. Now, if you're operating in like the uh, mountains or something like that, you're going to find it kind of garbage. So you're going to rely on I more than you probably wanted to. So once that's been all set up, if we actually look at the front windshield, you can go ahead and see exactly what that looks like. Now this site will update itself depending on what mode it's in. So currently I am sitting here in off mode, which also means I could fire an ATGM from this seat if I wanted to do so. I'm not going to do that here. And we're going to take a look at that. We'll land on the ground and kind of show you how that works a little later on. So what I will do though, is I will show you how some of these different modes work. So let's say, for example, I want to use my fixed 30 millimeter cannon. If you take a look here, there's just a little nice little piece that says it. So in this case, these would be all my gun pods, these three here. This one would say I want to use a fixed one, and I'll go ahead and MG30. So as soon as you do that, you're going to get this little warning light that's going to pop up. It's basically going to be, hey, good. did you know that this mode was on? So we're going to go ahead and make sure these two modes are on. We're going to make sure all those sights are set. And now what it's, it's trying to do is it's trying to calculate what our individual range is going to be. In this case, if I look, there's actually a second cross here, here, which tells you where your bullets are actually going to land. And this little line here is simply telling us exactly how far away. Now, if I pull the trigger now, you'll notice that it lands just a teeny, teeny bit short, which actually makes sense, given that they were a little bit high here. And again, it's trying to read off the radar altimeter in order to accurately determine where the bullets are going to land. Now, one thing I like to do is I like to go ahead and adjust things like uh, what you have for burst length, as well as rate of fire. I'm a huge fan of the high rate of fire. Uh, some people might not be a fan of that because it tends to make the helicopter go Rrr, to one side, but it is pretty satisfying. As you can see, <laughs> it totally threw off my trim. Ah! Now, the 30 millimeter cannon, uh, one thing we did find when we were playing with it in multi-crew, is that it can't actually be controlled from the front seat, as scary as that sounds. If you're going to control it from the front seat, uh, it's very difficult, because if you're not flying the helicopter, you're basically just trying to hold the trigger down when it's time to kind of go, sort of a thing, which makes it very, very tricky. All right, let's see how our not moving map is uh, getting us along here. Yeah, we're a little bit to the north of our position, but we don't know if it's the moving map's fault, or the not moving map's fault, or it's our fault. Taking a look down here, I notice that ADF station is slightly to our left, so I'll go ahead and execute a nice little turn. Now, one neat thing you have in here is you have the Petrovich, which is basically, you know, the little AI companion. In testing, I found the uh, Petrovich a little bit tricky to get it to do exactly what you wanted it to do, but it's actually not bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and jump in the front seat. I'm going to press, uh, you'll notice I have no control right now. That's because Petrovich is uh, flying our helicopter. So if I were to go bring 
up his little menu here, you actually get this little thing here. So I'm like completely letting go of the controls. I'm not touching them. Keep in mind, if I wanted to steal control away from Petrovich, I could actually press this E key and start flying from the front seat here, which is, it's, it, it's involved, it's involved. <laughs> so we have all sorts of fun things we can do here. We can actually adjust what our heading is. Like right now, I'd rather go 90 degrees. We can actually sit there and grab it and say, hey, go to 90 degrees. And now if I let go, Petrovich is gonna go ahead and I'll take a little bit of a left turn here and try to bring us back on course. Again, uh, he flies about as well as I do, which is to say, um, well, you can see. <laughs> so it's uh, going to be kind of an interesting experience. I think I overshot that just a tiny bit. I think we needed about 90. No, I said about 95 degrees. So maybe we have true. We're going to go ahead and slow it down a little bit. Say so we'll do 250. Oh! <laughs> this reminds me of the first time I tried to fly the gazelle. And again, this is a completely AI controlled. My hands are off the controls. You can see the actual stick is uh, sitting over here on the right. So now this is pretty fun to play with because uh, basically it's almost like a TDC, but you're trying to do some manual controls here. Yep, that's that's 250 kilometers per hour. Yep, that's it. Stay there. Stay, stay. So now what we can do is we can do things like we can adjust what altitude we're operating. We can even make him do different types of combat maneuvers. But the reason we jumped up front is uh, to play around with some of the settings we have here. Now in the front seat, of course, like I said, we can manually control everything. For example, if I went over here, manual will click the switch right here and switch this to the gun. I can actually fire the gun from the front seat, which is actually pretty cool. The other thing I could do up front as well is if I wanted to, is I can control the anti-tank guided missiles, which um, I love this little magic box that they come with. It's like this, <laughs> you know, you've got the switch for which one you're using. You just click to the one that you want. It'll tell you the little light is ready. And then you have this uh, really, really neat, well, I don't know. I feel like I puke if I try to look out the right side of something while I'm in a helicopter being flown by this guy. But we're, we'll make the best of it, kind of a thing like that. So what we can do here is that we can actually come over here, and this is a little handy-dandy switch. We can click on it, and then we can go ahead and push a button, and we can actually look into it. In this case, let's go ahead and open up my sight doors. Whoop. Go ahead and jump back out here real quick. Uh, observation, make sure everything's powered up. I think he is um, jerking us around a little too aggressively here. Yep, I see that my doors are closed. Ah, my readiness is lit, though, so that should uh, indicate that we do have control. Let's go double check to make sure all of our options here are set properly. Looks good, looks good. Don't need that one, but I'm going to turn it on. Never, nothing like a switch that you're not sure what it does. Go ahead and click that one on, and we should be able to go ahead and uh, take a look through the site here. Ah, so we're having a little bit of issue with the site here. We might have damaged it already, which is uh, something you will do plenty and plenty of times, by the way. Searing helper is on, Alt-S, and that looks good. Alt-Launch missile, that looks pretty good. All right, we'll pop back out. And we'll go ahead and just cycle the system. Okay, while that's running, we'll go ahead and uh, bring ourselves back into the back seat, and we'll kind of continue our little flight here. Uh, this looks to be a pretty good altitude at this time. I'll go ahead and flip it back on. Can't do anything, of course, until uh, we get the little readiness option here. So let's go ahead and slow this thing way, way down, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, when you try to fly this thing as if it was some kind of Cobra. Order ourselves a quick reversal. <laughs> I believe we've gotten ourselves into vortex ring state. Interesting. Well, that was fun. <laughs> he tried to kill us. No, it's all right. But what I was able to do during all that time was actually get this thing nice and stabilized and a nice pretty hover. And everything's uh, looking a little bit safer than it was just a few minutes ago, which means uh, now we can go ahead and take a look at some of the other weapon systems on board. So what I've done is I've activated my missile systems. I've gotten everything pre-selected. I've come here. My readiness is all ready to go. And now we're ready to rock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and look through the site here. I have a button bound to it on my keyboard. And I'm going to go ahead and press the open site doors. Now, when you first do this, what you're going to do is you're going to get this pretty little site that looks a little bit like this. Uh, first of all, a word of warning, um, don't have this site active if you're in a situation where you're maneuvering. You will damage the gyros, and it is tremendously, tremendously embarrassing when it happens to you. So what I can do now is I can go ahead and I use my joystick to slew this around. I can also use my mouse to do so. Um, one thing that I found that worked really well for me is I use the joystick kind of for broad strokes and I use the mouse for a little bit gentler strokes as well. Now, once you have this mode, uh, if you want to designate something, there is no designation. You simply look at the thing you want to attack. You have to kind of imagine that this is a, sort of like a little tank scope or something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lock it back up again. I'm going to have our little chap here. I'll go ahead and rotate us into another direction to make our lives just a little bit simpler here. Ooh, we're in combat mode. Ah, we need to switch over to the other mode. There we go. Now we have the ability to change our direction. So we'll go ahead and I'll bring ourselves around to the target region. And let go. And now he's just going to spin us around and probably make me puke. Whoa! <laughs> 
and you can see how uh, that works fairly well there. So now what makes uh, Petrovic uh, kind of interesting here is that after you've actually ordered him to go ahead and move like this, we can actually tell him, uh, go ahead and take a look where I'm looking and things like that. Um, this helicopter is extremely difficult to shoot from in a hover if you have any altitude. Because when the helicopter is actually sitting there, you're going to notice it has a significant little nose up attitude. This nose up attitude can block you being able to actually see out the front of where the gun sight itself is. Uh, if you do that, you're going to find, like I said, very, very challenging in order to go ahead and actually use that for that stuff. So let's go ahead and take a look, uh, see if there's anything kind of interesting to put a hole in here. I think I don't want to uh, start hover translating and making our way forward here too, too much. So I'll take a look, but we'll go ahead and I'll play with it anyway. This looks pretty good. Ah, that tree looks like a victim. All right, let's go ahead and fire up our operate. We're just going to activate the gyros. We're going to go ahead and take a look through the site. And now we have this little red light to tell us that uh, the weapon's ready to fire. But remember, when you first look through, it has to actually uncage itself in order to do it. Now I'm going to go ahead and give this thing just a moment. There we go. And you can go ahead and see that we have ourselves a couple different options here. Now you'll notice there's a little red light at the top of the screen that has shut itself off. The reason it did that is because I'm outside of the limits of the particular weapon. The other thing you're going to see is at the bottom, there's that little zero one, which is going to tell you relatively how tilted you are from where you're looking. In this case, if I'm looking at exactly zero, I'm basically looking right out the nose of the helicopter. You know, if I pull myself back up, you can see that I can go ahead and fire. Now, if I want to go ahead and fire, the thing I'm going to have to do is make sure I select the weapon, which I've already done. And you can just go ahead and press and hold on the trigger. And then you get this little thing that comes ripping out. Now, one of the fun tricks is after I fire it at a dumb angle like that, I can actually sit here and actually hold it steady and try to fly this thing. Now, the one thing I like is I like using the mouse for the purposes of stabilizing it because it makes it much, much simpler. Now, since you have no range finder on this, you're kind of at the mercy of uh, kind of whatever is going on here. Oh, just a little shy. That's all right. Go ahead and select another one. And I'll center myself up. Again, I can order Petrovich to go ahead and uh, stay into a safe direction. Go ahead and look outside of the site again real fast. Double check to make sure it is a missile is on launcher. And we have readiness. Everything looks good. And again, it's just a matter of going ahead and uh, firing where we can go ahead and get that green point. Now, if you're in multi-crew, you actually have the ability to actually order him to go ahead and you know start moving or something along those lines. So in this case, uh, let's go ahead and change this. I'll go ahead and order him to start moving forward. And I'll go ahead and zoom out a little bit here. Now we're on our way. Of course, this is a Petrovich, and he's probably going to get us killed, but that's all right. <laughs> Johnny, when you're working with teammates, it's a lot simpler. Now, with this particular helicopter, uh, one of the things we discover when we're playing at multi-crew is it is vastly easier to shoot this thing on the move than it is to try to shoot it while you're still. All right, looks good. Let's go ahead and look back through the site. Uncage. And a little red light says we can fire, but remember it takes about 10 seconds or so for those gyros to kind of spin up so that we can go ahead and use them. Ah, there we go. Now notice, because our pilot is tilted up so much, I can't actually fire. Even though we're moving, my sight is pointing up. And this is going to be a common problem you're going to run to. You have to fire these things on the move. So I'm actually going to go ahead and deploy one of these. Go ahead and zoom in, and we're just going to go ahead and fly this thing all the way down to the ground. Now that's kind of a cheap hack that we discovered yesterday because otherwise we'd have to be tilted and going quite a bit faster. This is a lot harder than it looks. Don't breathe. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> so as you can see, that can be uh, very, very challenging and it really requires a really, really steady hand in order to fire. We'll go ahead and uh, fire one more of those. I'm going to stick my head up so that I can get to the point where I can actually fire this thing. And like I said, you're at the mercy of um, wherever this thing is pointing. And unless the helicopter is pointing down, you can't even reliably fire it. And this is going to be a problem you're going to run into lots and lots and lots. And like I said, our quick workaround was basically to fire up and then try to arc the weapon back down, which requires, like I said, kind of a steady hand. All right, weapon away. I'm going to try to guide it right back onto our little tank friend here. So basically, you cannot use this helicopter for the purposes of um, trying to do pop-up attacks because you can't reliably fire its own weapons while you're... Ah, <laughs> come on. Oh, well. All right, we'll go ahead and take a look at one more type of weapons. Uh, then we'll go finish up our flight here. We're already getting a little long here. Go ahead and jump in the front back seat here. Take controls. Thank you. Go ahead and flip this thing over to the mode that's going to go ahead and give me access to the rockets. And this is going to say the word rocket. And you can see it gives me a little calculator there that lets me know exactly where I'm pointing. I'm going to go ahead and tip forward here. Now notice that I'm tipping forward and moving. I have a much, 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 much stabler platform for the purposes of firing those ATGMs. You can basically aim them directly. 
It's just one of those things that like, it, you'll run into it more than once. All right, start picking up a little bit of speed here. Notice that uh, we have the constantly computing impact site doing a decent job for us. Somebody's messed up my trim. <laughs> I bet you I could tell you who. All right, getting a little high, but that's all right. A little yellow light means go for it, but we're not quite in range yet. Now notice the button you're going to be pressing for firing the rockets is not the same button for firing the ATGMs. The ATGM is a different system. Nice. We'll go ahead and break away and I will make our way back and we'll go ahead and secure the helicopter. All right, so as you can see, it's a pretty solid platform. It's got a couple little quirks as you're probably going to run into, but remember this literally came out yesterday. The multi-crew experience on this thing is absolutely wonderful. Uh, I had an absolute blast. We basically played for six hours straight doing all sorts of uh, missions all around the world with this helicopter. Uh, like I was saying, uh, if you're going to be using the ATGMs, remember you have to have the helicopter moving in order to reliably shoot them. Otherwise, you could do that kind of cheap shot technique that I was using a little bit earlier. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring this thing all the way back to its destination, which isn't too, too far away from us. And then we'll go ahead, like I said, put this thing on the ground, and we'll go ahead and call it there. Unfortunately, I don't think I killed a single target in that entire strike. Bring us to the right a little bit, and we're basically on our way. Uh, one fun thing to do, of course, you get in the front seat. Try steering it from the front seat. <laughs> it's like a nightmare. Don't try it. Whoa! Petrovich, you are so good at messing up my trim. You'll know what I mean when you try it. Uh, one of the nice things, too, is uh, the good folks at DCS, or should say Eagle Dynamics, has actually made it so that you can preview all these for free and basically experiment with them for a few days. And like I said, for those of you who are not helicopter fans, uh, this is still pretty cool. i give myself a little bit more trim here. I'm overspeeding the helicopter actually pretty badly here, but that's actually pretty good. Nice and trimmed out. Let me go ahead and do a quick calculation. All right, that's going to put us on a 120 heading, and we're going to have to take a nice jump to the left here and start making our way there. Now, incredibly, my moving map is actually still pretty much got us exactly where we're supposed to be. Now, unfortunately for our moving map, it's not going to provide us with any information as far as where we need to go. Uh, that's something we need to work out ourselves, which, again, is a neat little challenge for this particular helicopter. One thing that we did discover uh, when we were experimenting with this uh, significantly yesterday was to trying to go ahead and making it so that you could go ahead and eject any of the weapons on board, you know, using the jettison kind of option. Uh, that was something that came up really badly because we lost one wing and not the other. So uh, we desperately had to jettison them. There's a couple different techniques we could find for that. Uh, the first one we discovered is there's a handy dandy emergency release switch right here. Arm it, and then you just click all the switches and everybody goes bye-bye. And now our helicopter is a lot lighter than it was a minute ago. And as a matter of fact, it just went boing and basically flew up in the air. By default, this helicopter is too heavy to safely fly. Now you'll notice that at the same setting power, I'm doing 300 kilometers per hour, which is working out to be about 160 knots. Uh, if you go past 300, uh, the retreating blade stall is very real on this particular helicopter, and it's going to start pulling itself really bad to the left. That means you're going too fast. Slow down. All right, we got ourselves up balanced out here. Cruising along at low altitude. Now, when you're cruising with this thing, like I said, uh, you make judicious use of your trim and keep an eye on that airspeed. Uh, right now, like I said, we are overspeeding this helicopter, which is causing the whole thing to want to twist to the left a little bit. Because again, one blade is now running from the other blade, which makes things a little bit not weird. Other things we discovered when we were doing uh, multi-crew activities with this one, uh, one thing was you have to really be able to communicate with the person in the front seat about the gyro that's on board of the actual gun sight for the ATGMs. If you do not communicate with that with them, um, what you're gonna end up doing is taking an emergency turn and snapping the gyro. So what happened for us, or not snapping the gyro, doing something with the linkage for it, where we actually ran into a situation where he would look straight and my gun sight back here in the back seat would actually point me off to the right. And it was completely impossible to uh, reconcile and correlate the two different systems together so that you could reliably fire them. So one of the strategies we discovered is you basically come in at a high altitude, fire three or four attacks, lock the thing, and then quickly pull out of the way. Uh, you can tell it's locked because you've got the little yellow light here that'll give you a heads up that that's working. The other thing, too, is you're going to get a little red light down here that says limit maneuver, and that's simply going to remind you that, uh, hey, if uh, you do any sudden maneuvers with this thing, you're probably going to break it. So that's another common thing that you're going to say. So for landing, uh, we're going to go ahead and do a pretty slow, gentle uh, rolling landing for this particular helicopter. Uh, one of the things I like about that landing is um, it's just easier. If you try to come in for a pure hover and then gently descend, you're probably going to run into that vortex ring state, especially if you're on a very, 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 very heavy load, which fortunately we are not. So I'm not going to stress about that too, too much. But again, um, absolute minimum control inputs right here. 
Now we do one on combustibles. Uh, looks like we got about three quarters of a tank. So you can see even in the relatively short flight, uh, we've gone through a tremendous amount of our maximum range in this particular helicopter. All right, time to bring ourselves in for a landing. I thought we'd skip the last part of that trip there. We have the runway right over there on our left. We're basically going to do a rolling landing. Now, one of the things I was mentioning earlier was how difficult this helicopter is to go ahead and uh, safely basically get it into a position where you can uh, basically land this thing. One of the issues you're going to have, and we saw this a couple times, is the fact your nose is going to be up so high during maneuvers that are slow that it becomes tremendously difficult to see. Uh, one of the tricks we found yesterday is actually have the person in the front seat do the landing. So in this case, we're on a handy dandy little left base here. I'm going to start reducing collective a little bit. You're going to have to put a little bit of left foot in. I'm just going to slow down just a little bit, lift the nose up. And one of the incidents we had, like I said, we had lost a wing. And now when we were coming in for a landing with this thing, we basically had to roll it in because we were also down an engine. Pull ourselves to the left a little bit here, looking pretty good. All right, that's looking pretty solid. We're going to go out, line ourselves up. We'll pull that a little wider than we needed to. But again, we're trying to slow down at the same time. Just going to lift up on the nose here and we're going to be pulling the collective back at the same time putting up quite a bit of left foot we're basically trying to do a nice gentle slowdown we don't want to do a quick stop because you're probably going to overspeed the rotors by accident Put that nose up as it starts to slow down and once you start getting very slow and that transitional lift starts to go away from you you're going to have to go ahead and start applying some of that other foot there we go we're going to drop the landing gear make sure you have hydraulic pressure if you need to emergency drop the landing gear there is a switch in the front seat that you can use for that purpose all right, I'm going to reset my view so I can see what's going on. As long as we are moving forward, uh, you don't have to worry too, too much about getting a little too slow. Uh, if you do start getting very, very slow or you start descending rapidly, like I said, you can end up basically descending into your own turbulence, which is going to be game over. So you want to be very cautious. Now, because my nose is down for me to see, I'm actually accelerating. So you have to be very cautious here. A little bit of crosswind from before is returning. I'm using plenty of trim. Smoothly apply a little bit of collective here to slow myself down at the last moment. And now you're going to run into, like I said, the issue that you, we had before, where it's very, very difficult to see over the nose of the helicopter as you're landing. Once you get close to the ground, by the way, you're going to go ahead and enter into ground effect. And when you do land, don't touch the brakes until the helicopter itself has begun to settle. If you do it too quickly, you're going to run into a situation where you're going to translate in place and end up crashing the helicopter. There we are. I'm going to not press anything with the brakes until I've gotten everything completely under control. Go ahead and hold it now. And now we have landed ourselves and successfully landed. Yeah, that sounds redundant. Haha. <laughs> All right, hopefully this video was interesting. Like I said, I was trying to do something different. You can see how ridiculously uh, trimmed I had my rotor there in order to reliably bring us forward. I tried to show you a couple tips that we found with this one as well as how to get this thing going. Uh, this is always fun. Uh, at the very, very end of the mission, we take a look at our little chart here and see how far <laughs> off we are, which is, uh, I'm not going to lie, it's not terrible. You can, of course, always just grab onto the thing and go ahead and uh, put it back into the correct position. In this case, uh, we're basically at the end of this runway here, and now uh, we can do the best we can. Now watch this. Now you're sitting there going, wait, where's my chart? Um, you only have one zoomed in chart, and that's going to be the one that's in your area. Enjoy.